Section 11 of The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange by Anna Catherine Green. Section 11. Problem 8. The Doctor, His Wife, and the Clock part two i was laboring under great excitement myself for as a private agent with no official authority such as he evidently attributed to me in the blindness of his passion i felt the incongruity of my position in the face of a matter of such tragic consequence besides i agreed with her that he was in a distempered state of mind and i hardly knew how to deal with one so fixed in his hallucination and with so much intelligence to support it but the emergency was great for he was holding out his wrists in the evident expectation of my taking him into instant custody and the sight was killing his wife who had sunk on the floor between us in terror and anguish you say you killed mr housebrook i began where did you get your pistol and what did you do with it after you left his house my husband had no pistol never had any pistol put in mrs zabriskie with vehement assertion if i had seen him with such a weapon i threw it away when i left the house i cast it as far from me as possible for i was frightened at what i had done horribly frightened no pistol was ever found i answered with a smile forgetting for the moment that he could not see if such an instrument had been found in the street after a murder of such consequence it certainly would have been brought to the police you forget that a good pistol is valuable property he went on stolidly someone came along before the general alarm was given and seeing such a treasure lying on the sidewalk picked it up and carried it off not being an honest man he preferred to keep it to drawing the attention of the police upon himself hm, perhaps i said but where did you get it surely you can tell where you procured such a weapon if as your wife intimates you did not own one i bought it that selfsame night of a friend a friend whom i will not name since he resides no longer in this country i he paused intense passion was in his face he turned towards his wife and a low cry escaped him which made her look up in fear i do not wish to go into any particulars said he god forsook me and i committed a horrible crime when i am punished perhaps peace will return to me and happiness to her i would not wish her to suffer too long or too bitterly for my sin constant what love was in the cry it seemed to move him and turn his thoughts for a moment into a different channel poor child he murmured stretching out his hands by an irresistible impulse towards her but the change was but momentary and he was soon again the stern and determined self-accuser are you going to take me before a magistrate he asked if so i have a few duties to perform which you are welcome to witness this was too much I felt that the time had come for me to disabuse his mind of the impression he had unwittingly formed of me. I therefore said as considerably as I could, You mistake my position, Dr. Zabriskie. Though a detective of some experience, I have no connection with the police and no right to intrude myself in a matter of such tragic importance. If, however, you are as anxious as you say to subject yourself to police examination, i will mention the same to the proper authorities and leave them to take such actions as they think best that will be more satisfactory to me said he for though i have many times contemplated giving myself up i have still much to do before i can leave my home and practice without injury to others good day when you want me you will find me here he was gone and the poor young wife was left crouching on the floor alone pitying her shame and terror i ventured to remark that it was not an uncommon thing for a man to confess to a crime he had never committed and assured her the matter would be inquired into very carefully before any attempt was made upon his liberty she thanked me and slowly rising tried to regain her equanimity but the manner as well as the matter of her husband's self-condemnation was too overwhelming in its nature for her to recover readily from her emotions i have long dreaded this she acknowledged for months I have foreseen that he would make some rash communication or insane avowal. If I had dared, I would have consulted some physician about this hallucination of his. But he was so sane on other points that I hesitated to give my dreadful secret to the world. 
i kept hoping that time and his daily pursuits would have their effect and restore him to himself but his illusion grows and now i fear that nothing will ever convince him that he did not commit the deed of which he accuses himself if he were not blind i would have more hope but the blind have so much time for brooding i think he had better be indulged in his fancies for the present i ventured if he is laboring under an illusion it might be dangerous to cross him if she echoed in an indescribable tone of amazement and dread can you for a moment harbor the idea that he has spoken the truth madam i returned with something of the cynicism of my calling what caused you to give such an unearthly scream just before this murder was made known to the neighborhood she stared and paled and finally began to tremble not as i now believe at the insinuation latent in my words but at the doubts which my question aroused in her own breast did i she asked then with a burst of candor which seemed inseparable from her nature she continued why do i try to mislead you or deceive myself i did give a shriek just before the alarm was raised next door but it was not from any knowledge i had of a crime having been committed but because i unexpectedly saw before me my husband whom i supposed to be on his way to poughkeepsie he was looking very pale and strange and for a moment i thought i stood face to face with his ghost but he soon explained his appearance by saying that he had fallen from the train and had only been saved by a miracle from being dismembered and i was just bemoaning his mishap and trying to calm him and myself when that terrible shout was heard next door of murder murder coming so soon after the shock he had himself experienced it quite unnerved him and i think we can date his mental disturbance from that moment for he began immediately to take a morbid interest in the affair next door though it was weeks if not months before he let a word fall of the nature of those you have just heard indeed it was not till i repeated to him some of the expressions he was continually letting fall in his sleep that he commenced to accuse himself of crime and talk of retribution you say that your husband frightened you on that night by appearing suddenly at the door when you thought him on his way to poughkeepsie is dr zabriskie in the habit of thus going and coming alone at an hour so late as this might have been you forget that to the blind night is less full of perils than the day often and often has my husband found his way to his patients houses alone after midnight but on this especial evening he had leonard with him leonard was his chauffeur and always accompanied him when he went any distance well then said i all we have to do is to summon leonard and hear what he has to say concerning this affair he will surely know whether or not his master went into the house next door leonard has left us she said dr zabriskie has another chauffeur now besides i have nothing to conceal from you leonard was not with him when he returned to the house that evening or the doctor would not have been without his portmanteau till the next day something i have never known what caused them to separate and that is why i have no answer to give the doctor when he accuses himself of committing a deed that night so wholly out of keeping with every other act of his life and have you never asked leonard why they separated and why he allowed his master to come home alone after the shock he had received at the station i did not know there was any reason for my doing so till long after he had left us and when did he leave that i do not remember a few weeks or possibly a few days after that dreadful night and where is he now ah that i have not the least means of knowing but she objected in sudden distress what do you want of leonard if he did not follow dr zabriskie to his own door he could tell us nothing that would convince my husband that he is laboring under an illusion but he might tell us something which would convince us that dr zabriskie was not himself after the accident that he hush came from her lips in imperious tones i will not believe that he shot mr hasbrook even if you prove him to have been insane at the time how could he my husband is blind it would take a man of very keen sight to force himself into a house closed for the night and kill a man in the dark at one shot on the contrary it is only a blind man who could do this cried a voice from the doorway those who trust to eyesight must be able to catch a glimpse of the mark they aim at and this room as i have been told was without a glimmer of light but the blind trust to sound and as mr hasbrook spoke oh 
burst from the horrified wife. Is there no one to stop him when he speaks like that? 3. As you will see, this matter, so recklessly entered into, had proved to be of too serious a nature for me to pursue it farther without the cognizance of the police. Having a friend on the force in whose discretion I could rely, I took him into my confidence and asked for his advice. He pooh-poohed the doctor's statements, but said that he would bring the matter to the attention of the superintendent and let me know the result. I agreed to this, and we parted with the mutual understanding that mum was the word till some official decision had been arrived at. I had not long to wait. At an early day he came in with the information that there had been, as might be expected, a division of opinion among his superiors as to the importance of Dr. Zabriskie's so-called confession, but in one point they had been unanimous, and that was the desirability of his appearing before them at headquarters for a personal examination. As, however, in the mind of two out of three of them his condition was attributed entirely to acute mania, it had been thought best to employ as their emissary one in whom he had already confided and submitted his case to, in other words, myself. The time was set for the next afternoon at the close of his usual office hours. He went without reluctance, his wife accompanying him. In the short time which elapsed between their leaving home and entering headquarters, I embraced the opportunity of observing them, and I found the study equally exciting and interesting. His face was calm but hopeless, and his eye, dark and unfathomable, but neither frenzied nor uncertain. He spoke but once and listened to nothing, though now and then his wife moved as if to attract his attention, and once even stole her hand towards his, in the tender hope that he would feel its approach and accept her sympathy. But he was deaf as well as blind, and sat wrapped up in thoughts which she, I know, would have given worlds to penetrate. Her countenance was not without its mystery also. She showed in every lineament passion, concern, and misery, and a deep tenderness from which the element of fear was not absent. But she, as well as he, betrayed that some misunderstanding deeper than any I had previously suspected drew its intangible veil between them, and made the near proximity in which they sat at once a heart-piercing delight and an unspeakable pain. What was the misunderstanding, and what was the character of the fear that modified her every look of love in his direction? Her perfect indifference to my presence proved that it was not connected with the position in which he had placed himself towards the police by his voluntary confession of crime, nor could I thus interpret the expression of frantic question which now and then contracted her features, as she raised her eyes towards his sightless orbs, and strove to read in his firm set lips the meaning of those assertions she could only ascribe to loss of reason. The stopping of the carriage seemed to awaken both from thoughts that separated rather than united them. He turned his face in her direction, and she, stretching forth her hand, prepared to lead him from the carriage, without any of that display of timidity which had previously been evident in her manner. As his guide, she seemed to fear nothing. As his lover, everything. There is another and a deeper tragedy underlying the outward obvious one, was my inward conclusion, as I followed them into the presence of the gentleman awaiting them. Dr. Zabriskie's quiet appearance was in itself a shock to those who had anticipated the feverish unrest of a madman. So was his speech, which was calm, straightforward, and quietly determined. "'I shot Mr. Hasbrook,' was his steady affirmation, given without any show of frenzy or desperation. "'If you ask me why I did it, I cannot answer. If you ask me how, I am ready to state all that I know concerning the matter.' "'But, Dr. Zabriskie,' interposed one of the inspectors, "'the why is the most important thing for us to consider just now. "'If you really desire to convince us that you committed this dreadful crime "'of killing a totally inoffensive man, "'you should give us some reason for an act so opposed to all your instincts and general conduct.' "'But the doctor continued unmoved. "'I had no reason for murdering Mr. Hasbrook. "'A hundred questions can elicit no other reply. "'You had better keep to the how.' A deep-drawn breath from the wife answered the looks of the three gentlemen to whom this suggestion was offered. "'You see,' that breath seemed to protest, "'that he is not in his right mind.' I began to waver in my own opinion, and yet the intuition which has served me in cases seemingly as impenetrable as this bade me beware of following the general judgment. "'Ask him to inform you how he got into the house,' I whispered to Inspector D., who sat nearest me. Immediately the inspector put the question which I had suggested. 
by what means did you enter mr hasbrook's house at so late an hour as this murder occurred the blind doctor's head fell forward on his breast and he hesitated for the first and only time you will not believe me said he but the door was ajar when i came to it such things make crime easy it is the only excuse i have to offer for this dreadful deed the front door of a respectable citizen's house ajar at half past eleven at night it was a statement that fixed in all minds the conviction of the speaker's irresponsibility mrs zabriskie's brow cleared and her beauty became for a moment dazzling as she held out her hands in irrepressible relief towards those who were interrogating her husband i alone kept my impassibility a possible explanation of this crime had flashed like lightning across my mind an explanation from which i inwardly recoiled even while i felt forced to consider it dr zabriskie remarked the inspector formerly mentioned as friendly to him such old servants as those kept by mr hasbrook do not leave the front door ajar at twelve o'clock at night yet ajar it was repeated the blind doctor with quiet emphasis and finding it so i went in when i came out again i closed it do you wish me to swear what i say if so i am ready what reply could they give to see this splendid-looking man hallowed by an affliction so great that in itself it called forth the compassion of the most indifferent accusing himself of a cold-blooded crime in tones which sounded dispassionate because of the will forcing their utterance was too painful in itself for any one to indulge in unnecessary words compassion took the place of curiosity and each and all of us turned involuntary looks of pity upon the young wife pressing so eagerly to his side for a blind man ventured one the assault was both deft and certain are you accustomed to mr hasbrook's house that you found your way with so little difficulty to his bedroom i am accustomed he began but here his wife broke in with irrepressible passion he is not accustomed to that house he has never been beyond the first floor why why do you question him do you not see his hand was on her lips hush he commanded you know my skill in moving about a house how i sometimes deceive those who do not know me into believing that i can see by the readiness with which i avoid obstacles and find my way even in strange and untried scenes do not try to make them think i am not in my right mind or you will drive me into the very condition you attribute to me his face rigid cold and set looked like that of a mask hers drawn with horror and filled with question that was fast taking the form of doubt bespoke an awful tragedy from which more than one of us recoiled can you shoot a man dead without seeing him asked the superintendent with painful effort give me a pistol and i will show you was the quick reply a low cry came from the wife in a drawer near to every one of us there lay a pistol but no one moved to take it out there was a look in the doctor's eye which made us fear to trust him with a pistol just then we will accept your assurance that you possess a skill beyond that of most men returned the superintendent and beckoning me forward he whispered this is a case for the doctors and not for the police remove him quietly and notify dr southyard of what i say but dr zabriskie who seemed to have an almost supernatural acuteness of hearing gave a violent start at this and spoke up for the first time with real passion in his voice no no i pray you i can bear anything but that remember gentlemen that i am blind that i cannot see who is about me that my life would be a torture if i felt myself surrounded by spies watching to catch some evidence of madness in me rather conviction at once death dishonor and obloquy these i have incurred these i have brought upon myself by crime but not this worse fate oh not this worse fate his passion was so intense and yet so confined within the bounds of decorum that we felt strangely impressed by it only the wife stood transfixed with the dread growing in her heart till her white waxen visage seemed even more terrible to contemplate than his passion distorted one it is not strange that my wife thinks me demented the doctor continued as if afraid of the silence that answered him but it is your business to discriminate and you should know a sane man when you see him 
Inspector D. no longer hesitated. Very well, said he. Give me the least proof that your assertions are true, and we will lay your case before the prosecuting attorney. Proof? Is not a man's word? No man's confession is worth much without some evidence to support it. In your case there is none. You cannot even produce the pistol with which you assert yourself to have committed the deed. True, true, I was frightened by what I had done, and the instinct of self-preservation led me to rid myself of the weapon in any way I could. But someone found this pistol, someone picked it up from the sidewalk of Lafayette Place on that fatal night. Advertise for it, offer a reward, I will give you the money. Suddenly he appeared to realize how all this sounded. Alas, cried he, I know the story seems improbable, but it is not the probable things that happen in this life, as you should know, who every day dig deep into the heart of human affairs. Were these the ravings of insanity? I began to understand the wife's terror. I bought the pistol, he went on, of, alas, I cannot tell you his name. Everything is against me. I cannot adduce one proof, yet even she is beginning to fear that my story is true. I know it by her silence, a silence that yawns between us like a deep and unfathomable gulf. But at these words her voice rang out with passionate vehemence. No, no, it is false. I will never believe that your hands have been plunged in blood. You are my own pure-hearted constant cold perhaps and stern but with no guilt upon your conscience save in your own wild imagination zolma you are no friend to me he declared pushing her gently aside believe me innocent but say nothing to lead these others to doubt my word and she said no more but her looks spoke volumes the result was that he was not detained though he prayed for instant commitment he seemed to dread his own home and the surveillance to which he instinctively knew he would henceforth be subjected. To see him shrink from his wife's hand as she strove to lead him from the room was sufficiently painful. But the feelings thus aroused was nothing to that with which we observed the keen and agonized expectancy of his look as he turned and listened for the steps of the officer who followed him. From this time on I shall never know whether or not I am alone, was his final observation as he left the building. Here is where the matter rests, and here, Miss Strange, is where you come in. The police were for sending an expert alienist into the house, but agreeing with me, and in fact with the doctor himself, that if he were not already out of his mind, this would certainly make them so, they, at my earnest intercession, have left the next move to me. That move, as you must by this time understand, involves you. You have advantages for making Mrs. Zabriskie's acquaintance of which I beg you to avail yourself. As friend or patient you must win your way into that home. You must sound to its depths one or both of these two wretched hearts. Not so much now for any possible reward which may follow the elucidation of this mystery which has come so near being shelved, but for pity's sake and the possible settlement of a question which is fast driving a lovely member of your sex distracted. May I rely on you? If so. Various instructions followed, over which Violet mused with a deprecatory shaking of her head till the little clock struck two. Why should she, already in a state of secret despondency, intrude herself into an affair at once so painful and so hopeless? 4. But by morning her mood changed. The pathos of the situation had seized upon her in her dreams, and before the day was over, she was to be seen, as a prospective patient, in Dr. Zabriskie's office. She had a slight complaint as her excuse, and she made the most of it. That is, at first. But as the personality of this extraordinary man began to make its usual impression, she found herself forgetting her own condition in the intensity of interest she felt in his. Indeed, she had to pull herself together more than once, lest he should suspect the double nature of her errand, and she actually caught herself at times rejoicing in his affliction, since it left her with only her voice to think of, in her hated but necessary task of deception. That she succeeded in this effort, even with one of his nice ear, was evident from the interested way in which he dilated upon her malady, and the minute instructions he was careful to give her the physician being always uppermost in his strange dual nature, when he was in his office or at the bedside of the sick. 
and had she not been a deep reader of the human soul she would have left his presence in simple wonder at his skill and entire absorption in an exacting profession but as it was she carried with her an image of subdued suffering which drove her from that moment on to ask herself what she could do to aid him in his fight against his own illusion for to associate such a man with a senseless and cruel murder was preposterous what this wish helped by no common determination led her into it was not in her mind to conceive she was making her one great mistake but as yet she was in happy ignorance of it and pursued the course laid out for her without a doubt of the ultimate result having seen and made up her mind about the husband she next sought to see and gauge the wife that she succeeded in doing this by means of one of her sly little tricks is not to the point but what followed in natural consequence is very much so a mutual interest sprang up between them which led very speedily to actual friendship mrs zabriskie's hungry heart opened to the sympathetic little being who clung to her in such evident admiration while violet brought face to face with a real woman succumbed to feelings which made it no imposition on her part to spend much of her leisure in zulma zabriskie's company the result were the following naive reports which drifted into her employer's office from day to day as this intimacy deepened the doctor is settling into a deep melancholy from which he tries to rise at times but with only indifferent success yesterday he rode around to all his patients for the purpose of withdrawing his services on the plea of illness but he still keeps his office open and today i had the opportunity of witnessing his reception and treatment of the many sufferers who came to him for aid I think he was conscious of my presence, though an attempt had been made to conceal it. For the listening look never left his face from the moment he entered the room, and once he rose and passed quickly from wall to wall, groping with outstretched hands into every nook and corner, and barely escaping contact with the curtain behind which I was hidden. But if he suspected my presence, he showed no displeasure at it, wishing perhaps for a witness to his skill in the treatment of disease and truly i never beheld a finer manifestation of practical insight in cases of a more or less baffling nature he is certainly a most wonderful physician and i feel bound to record that his mind is as clear for business as if no shadow had fallen upon it dr zabriskie loves his wife but in a way torturing to himself and to her if she is gone from the house he is wretched and yet when she returns he often forbears to speak to her or if he does speak it is with a constraint that hurts her more than his silence I was present when she came in today. Her step, which had been eager on the stairway, flagged as she approached the room, and he naturally noticed the change and gave his own interpretation to it. His face, which had been very pale, flushed suddenly, and a nervous trembling seized him which he sought in vain to hide. But by the time her tall and beautiful figure stood in the doorway, he was his usual self again in all but the expression of his eyes, which stared straight before him in an agony of longing only to be observed in those who have once seen. "'Where have you been, Zulma?' he asked, as contrary to his wont, he moved to meet her. "'To my mother's, to Arnold and Constable's, and to the hospital, as you requested,' was her quick answer, made without faltering or embarrassment. He stepped still nearer, and took her hand, and as he did so my eye fell on his, and I noted that his finger lay over her pulse in seeming unconsciousness. "'Nowhere else?' he queried. She smiled the saddest kind of smile and shook her head. Then, remembering that he could not see this movement, she cried in a wistful tone, "'Nowhere else, Constant. I was too anxious to get back.' I expected him to drop her hand at this, but he did not, and his finger still rested on her pulse." and whom did you see while you were gone he continued she told him naming over several names you must have enjoyed yourself was his cold comment as he let go her hand and turned away but his manner showed relief and i could not but sympathize with the pitiable situation of a man who found himself forced into means like this for probing the heart of his young wife yet when i turned towards her i realized that her position was but little happier than his tears are no strangers to her eyes but those which welled up at this moment seemed to possess a bitterness that promised but little peace for her future yet she quickly dried them and busied herself with ministrations for his comfort if i am any judge of woman zulma zabriskie is superior to most of her sex that her husband mistrusts her is evident but whether this is the result of the stand she has taken in his regard or only a manifestation of dementia i have as yet been unable to determine 
i dread to leave them alone together and yet when i presume to suggest that she should be on her guard in her interviews with him she smiles very placidly and tells me that nothing would give her greater joy than to see him lift his hand against her for that would argue that he is not accountable for his deeds or assertions yet it would be a grief to see her injured by this passionate and unhappy man you have said that you wanted all the details i could give so i feel bound to say that dr zabriskie tries to be considerate of his wife though he often fails in the attempt when she offers herself as his guide or assists him with his mail or performs any of the many acts of kindness by which she continually manifests her sense of his affliction he thanks her with courtesy and often with kindness yet i know she would willingly exchange all his set phrases for one fond embrace or impulsive smile of affection it would be too much to say that he is not in the full possession of his faculties and yet upon what other hypothesis can we account for the inconsistencies of his conduct i have before me two visions of mental suffering at noon i passed the office door and looking within saw the figure of dr zabriskie seated in his great chair lost in thought or deep in those memories which make an abyss in one's consciousness his hands which were clenched rested upon the arms of his chair and in one of them i detected a woman's glove which i had no difficulty in recognizing as one of the pair worn by his wife this morning he held it as a tiger might hold his prey or a miser his gold but his set features and sightless eyes betrayed that a conflict of emotions was being waged within him among which tenderness had but little share though alive as he usually is to every sound he was too absorbed at this moment to notice my presence though i had taken no pains to approach quietly i therefore stood for a full minute watching him till an irresistible sense of the shame at thus spying upon a blind man in his moments of secret anguish compelled me to withdraw but not before i saw his features relax in a storm of passionate feeling as he rained kisses after kisses on the senseless kid he had so long held in his motionless grasp yet when an hour later he entered the dining-room on his wife's arm there was nothing in his manner to show that he had in any way changed in his attitude toward her the other picture was more tragic still i was seeking mrs zabriskie in her own room when i caught a fleeting vision of her tall form with her arms thrown up over her head in a paroxysm of feeling which made her as oblivious to my presence as her husband had been several years before were the words that escaped her lips thank god we have no children or was this exclamation suggested to me by the passion and unrestrained impulse of her action so much up to date interesting enough or so her employer seemed to think as he went hurriedly through the whole story one special afternoon in his office tapping each sheet as he laid it aside with his sagacious forefinger as though he would say enough my theory still holds good nothing contradictory here on the contrary complete and undisputable confirmation of the one and only explanation of this astounding crime what was that theory and in what way and through whose efforts had he been enabled to form one the following notes may enlighten us though written in his own hand and undoubtedly a memorandum of his own activities he evidently thinks it worth while to reperuse them in connection with those he had just laid aside we can do no better than to read them also we omit dates watched the zabriskie mansion for five hours this morning from the second story window of an adjoining hotel saw the doctor when he drove away on his round of visits and saw him when he returned a colored man accompanied him Today I followed Mrs. Zabriskie. She went first to a house in Washington Place, where I am told her mother lives. Here she stayed some time, after which she drove down to Canal Street, where she did some shopping, and later stopped at the hospital, into which I took the liberty of following her. She seemed to know many there, and passed from cot to cot with a smile, in which I alone discerned the sadness of a broken heart. When she left, I left also, without having learned anything beyond the fact that Mrs. Zabriskie is one who does her duty in sorrow as in joy a rare and trustworthy woman i should say and yet her husband does not trust her why i have spent this day in accumulating details in regard to dr and mrs zabriskie's life previous to the death of mr hasbrook i learned from sources it would be unwise to quote just here that mrs zabriskie had not lacked enemies to charge her with coquetry that while she had never sacrificed her dignity in public more than one person had been heard to declare that dr zabriskie was fortunate in being blind since the sight of his wife's beauty would have but poorly compensated him for the pain he would have suffered in seeing how that beauty was admired that all gossip is more or less tinged with exaggeration i have no doubt yet when a name is mentioned in connection with such stories there is usually some truth at the bottom of them and a name is mentioned in this case though i do not think it worth my while to repeat it here 
and loath as i am to recognize the fact it is a name that carries with it doubts that might easily account for the husband's jealousy true i have found no one who dares hint that she still continues to attract attention or to bestow smiles in any direction save where they legally belong for since a certain memorable night which we all know neither dr zabriskie nor his wife have been seen save in their own domestic circle and it is not into such scenes that this serpent to whom i have just alluded ever intrudes nor is it in places of sorrow or suffering that his smile shines or his fascinations flourish and so one portion of my theory is proved to be sound dr zabriskie is jealous of his wife whether with good cause or bad i am not prepared to decide since her present attitude clouded as it is by the tragedy in which she and her husband are both involved must differ very much from that which she held when her life was unshattered by doubt and her admirers could be counted by the score i have just found out where leonard is as he is in service some miles up the river i shall have to be absent from my post for several hours but i consider the game well worth the candle light at last i have not only seen leonard but succeeded in making him talk his story is substantially this that on the night so often mentioned he packed his master's portmanteau at eight o'clock and at ten called a taxi and rode with the doctor to the central station he was told to buy tickets to poughkeepsie where his master had been called in consultation and having done this hurried back to join dr zabriskie on the platform they had walked together as far as the cars and dr zabriskie was just stepping on to the train when a man pushed himself hurriedly between them and whispered something into his master's ear which caused him to fall back and lose his footing dr zabriskie's body slid half under the car but he was withdrawn before any harm was done though the cars gave a lurch at that moment which must have frightened him exceedingly for his face was white when he rose to his feet and when leonard offered to assist him again on the train he refused to go and said he would return home and not attempt to ride to poughkeepsie that night end of section eleven Section 12 of The Glass Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange by Anna Catherine Green. Section 12. Problem 8. The Doctor his wife and the clock part three the gentleman whom leonard now saw to be mr stanton an intimate friend of dr zabriskie smiled very queerly at this and taking the doctor's arm led him back to his own auto leonard naturally followed them but the doctor hearing his steps turned and bade him in a very peremptory tone to take the cars home and then as if on second thought told him to go to poughkeepsie in his stead and explain to the people there that he was too shaken up by his misstep to do his duty and that he would be with them next morning this seemed strange to leonard but he had no reasons for disobeying his master's orders and so rode to poughkeepsie but the doctor did not follow him the next day on the contrary he telegraphed for him to return and when he got back dismissed him with a month's wages this ended leonard's connection with the zabriskie family a simple story bearing out what the wife has already told us but it furnishes a link which may prove invaluable mr stanton whose first name is theodore knows the real reason why dr zabriskie returned home on the night of the seventeenth of july nineteen mr stanton consequently is the man to see and this shall be my business tomorrow checkmate theodore stanton is not in this country though this points him out as the man from whom dr zabriskie bought the pistol it does not facilitate my work which is becoming more and more difficult mr stanton's whereabouts are not even known to his most intimate friends he sailed from this country most unexpectedly on the eighteenth of july a year ago which was the day after the murder of mr hasbrook it looks like a flight especially as he has failed to maintain open communication even with his relatives was he the man who shot mr hasbrook no but he was the man who put the pistol in dr zabriskie's hand that night and whether he did this with purpose or not was evidently so alarmed at the catastrophe which followed that he took the first outgoing steamer to europe so far all is clear but there are mysteries yet to be solved which will require my utmost tact 
what if i should seek out the gentleman with whose name that of mrs zabriskie has been linked and see if i can in any way connect him with mr stanton or the events of that night eureka i have discovered that mr stanton cherished a mortal hatred for the gentleman above mentioned it was a covert feeling but no less deadly on that account and while it never led him into any extravagances it was a force sufficient to account for many a secret misfortune occurring to that gentleman now if i can prove that he is the mephistopheles who whispered insinuations into the ear of our blind faust i may strike a fact that will lead me out of this maze but how can i approach secrets so delicate without compromising the woman i feel bound to respect if only for the devoted love she manifests for her unhappy husband i shall have to appeal to joe smithers this is something which i always hate to do but as long as he will take money and as long as he is fertile in resources for obtaining the truth from people i am myself unable to reach i must make use of his cupidity and his genius he is an honorable fellow in one way and never retails as gossip what he acquires for our use how will he proceed in this case and by what tactics will he gain the very delicate information which we need i own that i am curious to see i shall really have to put down at length the incidents of this night i always knew that joe smithers was invaluable not only to myself but to the police but i really did not know he possessed talents of so high an order he wrote me this morning that he has succeeded in getting mr t s promise to spend the evening with him and advised me that if i desired to be present as well his own servant would not be at home and that an opener of bottles would be required as i was very anxious to see mr t with my own eyes i accepted this invitation to play the spy and went at the proper hour to mr smithers rooms i found them picturesque in the extreme piles of books stacked here and there to the ceiling made nooks and corners which could be quite shut off by a couple of old pictures set into movable frames capable of swinging out or in at the whim or convenience of the owner as i had use for the dark shadows cast by these pictures i pulled them both out and made such other arrangements as appeared likely to facilitate the purpose i had in view then i sat down and waited for the two gentlemen who were expected to come in together they arrived almost immediately whereupon i rose and played my part with all necessary discretion while ridding mr t of his overcoat i stole a look at his face it is not a handsome one but it boasts of a gay devil-may-care expression which doubtless makes it dangerous to many women while his manners are especially attractive and his voice the richest and most persuasive that i ever heard i contrasted him almost against my will with dr zabriskie and decided that with most women the former's undoubted fascinations of speech and bearing would outweigh the latter's great beauty and mental endowments but i doubted if they would with her the conversation which immediately began was brilliant but desultory for mr smithers with an airy lightness for which he is remarkable introduced topic after topic perhaps for the purpose of showing off mr t s versatility and perhaps for the deeper and more sinister purpose of shaking the kaleidoscope of talk so thoroughly that the real topic which we were met to discuss should not make an undue impression on the mind of his guest meanwhile one two three bottles passed and i had the pleasure of seeing joe smithers's eye grow calmer and that of mr t more brilliant and more uncertain as the last bottle was being passed joe cast me a meaning glance and the real business of the evening began i shall not attempt to relate the half dozen failures which joe made in endeavoring to elicit the facts we were in search of without arousing the suspicion of his visitor i am only going to relate the successful attempt they had been talking now for some hours and i who had long before been waved aside from their immediate presence was hiding my curiosity and growing excitement behind one of the pictures when i suddenly heard joe say he has the most remarkable memory i ever met he can tell to a day when any notable event occurred pshaw answered his companion who by the way was known to pride himself upon his own memory for dates i can state where i went and what i did on every day in the year that may not embrace what you call notable events but the memory required is all the more remarkable is it not pooh was his friend's provoking reply you are bluffing ben i will never believe that mr t who had passed by this time into that stage of intoxication which makes persistence in an assertion a duty as well as a pleasure threw back his head and as the wreaths of smoke rose in airy spirals from his lips 
reiterated his statement and offered to submit to any test of his vaunted powers which the other might dictate you keep a diary began joe which at the present moment is at home completed the other will you allow me to refer to it to-morrow if i am suspicious of the accuracy of your recollections undoubtedly returned the other very well then i will wager you a cool fifty that you cannot tell where you were between the hours of ten and eleven on a certain night which i will name done cried the other bringing out his pocket-book and laying it on the table before him joe followed his example and then summoned me write a date down here he commanded pushing a piece of paper towards me with a look keen as the flash of a blade any date man he added as i appeared to hesitate in the embarrassment i thought natural under the circumstances put down day month and year only don't go too far back not farther than two years smiling with the air of a flunkey admitted to the sports of his superiors i wrote a line and laid it before mr smithers who at once pushed it with a careless gesture towards his companion you can of course guess the date i made use of july seventeenth nineteen mr t who had evidently looked upon this matter as mere play flushed scarlet as he read these words and for one instant looked as if he had rather fly the house than answer joe smithers's nonchalant glance of inquiry i have given my word and will keep it he said at last but with a look in my direction that sent me reluctantly back to my retreat i don't suppose you want names he went on that is if anything i have to tell is of a delicate nature oh no answered the other only facts and places i don't think places are necessary either he returned i will tell you what i did and that must serve you i did not promise to give number and street well well joe exclaimed earn your fifty that is all show that you remember where you were on the night of and with an admirable show of indifference he pretended to consult the paper between them the seventeenth of july two years ago and i shall be satisfied i was at the club for one thing said mr t then i went to see a lady friend where i stayed until eleven she wore a blue muslin what is that i had betrayed myself by a quick movement which sent a glass tumbler crashing to the floor zulma zabriskie had worn a blue muslin on that same night you will find it noted in the report given me by the policeman who saw her on the balcony that noise it was joe who was speaking you don't know rumid as well as i do or you wouldn't ask it is his practice i am sorry to say to accentuate his pleasure in draining my bottles by dropping a glass at every third one mr t went on she was a married woman and i thought she loved me but and this is the greatest proof i can offer you that i am giving you a true account of that night she had not the slightest idea of the extent of my passion and only consented to see me at all because she thought poor thing that a word from her would set me straight and rid her of attentions she evidently failed to appreciate a sorry figure for a fellow like me to cut but you caught me on the most detestable date in my calendar and there he ceased to be interesting and i was anxious the secret of a crime for which there seemed to be no reasonable explanation is no longer a mystery to me i have but to warn miss strange he had got thus far when a sound in the room behind him led him to look up a lady had entered a lady heavily veiled and trembling with what appeared to be an intense excitement he thought he knew the figure but the person whoever it was stood so still and remained so silent he hesitated to address her which seeing she pushed up her veil and all doubt vanished it was violet herself in disregard of her usual practice she had come alone to the office this meant urgency of some kind had she too sounded this mystery no or her aspect would not have worn this look of triumph what had happened then he made an instant endeavor to find out you have news he quietly remarked good news i should judge by your very cheery smile yes i think i have found the way of bringing dr zabriskie to himself astonished beyond measure so little did these words harmonize with the impressions and conclusions at which he had just arrived something very like doubt spoke in his voice as he answered with the simple exclamation you do yes he is obsessed by a fixed idea and must be given an opportunity to test the truth of that idea the shock of finding it a false one may restore him to his normal condition he believes that he shot mr hasbrook with no other guidance than his sense of hearing now if it can be proved that his hearing is an insufficient guide for such an act 
as of course it is the shock of the discovery may clear his brain of its cobwebs mrs zabriskie thinks so and the police what's that the police yes dr zabriskie would be taken before them again this morning no entreaties on the part of his wife would prevail he insisted upon his guilt and asked her to accompany him there and the poor woman found herself forced to go of course he encountered again the same division of opinion among the men he talked with three out of the four judged him insane which observing he betrayed great agitation and reiterated his former wish to be allowed an opportunity to prove his sanity by showing his skill in shooting this made an impression and a disposition was shown to grant his request then and there but mrs zabriskie would not listen to this she approved of the experiment but begged that it might be deferred till another day and then take place in some spot remote from the city for some reason they heeded her and she has just telephoned me that this attempt of his is to take place tomorrow in the new jersey woods i am sorry that this should have been put through without you and when i tell you that the idea originated with me that from some word i purposely let fall one day they both conceived of this plan of ending the uncertainty that was devouring their lives you will understand my excitement and the need i have of your support tell me that i have done well do not show me such a face you frighten me i do not wish to frighten you i merely wish to know just who are going on this expedition some members of the police dr zabriskie his wife and and myself she begged you must not go why the affair is to be kept secret the doctor will shoot fail oh she suddenly broke in alarmed by his expression you think he will not fail i think that you had better heed my advice and stay out of it the affair is now in the hands of the police and your place is anywhere but where they are but i go as her particular friend they have given her the privilege of taking with her one of her own sex and she has chosen me i shall not fail her father is away and if the awful disappointment you suggest awaits her there is all the more reason why she should have some sympathetic support this was true that the fresh protest he was about to utter died on his lips instead he simply remarked as he bowed her out i foresee that we shall not work much longer together you are nearing the end of your endurance he never forgot the smile she threw back at him five there are some events which impress the human mind so deeply that their memory mingles with all after experiences though violet had made it a rule to forget as soon as possible the tragic episodes incident to the strange career upon which she had so mysteriously embarked there was destined to be one scene if not more which she has never been able to dismiss at will this was the sight which met her eyes from the bow of the small boat in which dr zabriskie and his wife were rowed over to jersey on the afternoon which saw the end of this most sombre drama though it was by no means late in the day the sun was already sinking and the bright red glare which filled the west and shone full upon the faces of the half dozen people before her added much to the tragic nature of the scene though she was far from comprehending its full significance the doctor sat with his wife in the stern and it was upon their faces violet's glance was fixed the glare shone luridly on his sightless eyeballs and as she noticed his unwinking lids she realized as never before what it was to be blind in the midst of sunshine his wife's eyes on the contrary were lowered but there was a look of hopeless misery in her colorless face which made her appearance infinitely pathetic and violet felt confident that if he could only have seen her he would not have maintained the cold and unresponsive manner which chilled the words on his poor wife's lips and made all advance on her part impossible on the seat in front of them sat an inspector and from some quarter possibly from under the inspector's coat there came the monotonous ticking of the small clock which was to serve as a target for the blind man's aim this ticking was all violet heard though the river was alive with traffic and large and small boats were steaming by them on every side I am sure that it was all that mrs. Zabriskie heard also as with hand pressed to her heart and eyes fixed on the opposite shore she waited for the event which was to determine whether the man she loved was a criminal or only a being afflicted of God and worthy of her unceasing care and devotion as the Sun cast its last scarlet gleam over the water the boat grounded and violet was enabled to have one passing word with mrs. Zabriskie she hardly knew what she said but the look she received in return was like that of a frightened child but there was always to be seen in mrs zabriskie's countenance this characteristic blending of the severe and the childlike and beyond an added pang of pity for this beautiful but afflicted woman 
Violet let the moment pass without giving it the weight it perhaps demanded. The doctor and his wife had a long talk last night, was whispered in her ear, as she wound her way with the rest into the heart of the woods. With a start she turned and perceived her employer following close behind her. He had come by another boat. But it did not seem to heal whatever breach lies between them, he proceeded. Then, in a quick, anxious tone, he whispered, Whatever happens, do not lift your veil. I thought I saw a reporter skulking in the rear. I will be careful, Violet assured him, and could say no more, as they had already reached the ground which had been selected for this trial at arms, and the various members of the party were being placed in their several positions. The doctor, to whom light and darkness were alike, stood with his face toward the western glow, and at his side were grouped the inspector and the two physicians. On the arm of one of the latter hung Dr. Zabriskie's overcoat, which he had taken off as soon as he reached the field. Mrs. Zabriskie stood at the other end of the opening near a tall stump, upon which it had been decided that the clock should be placed when the moment came for the doctor to show his skill. She had been accorded the privilege of setting this clock on the stump, and Violet saw it shining in her hand as she paused for a moment to glance back at the circle of gentlemen who were awaiting her movements. The hands of the clock stood at five minutes to five, though Violet scarcely noted it at the time, for Mrs. Zabriskie was passing her and had stopped to say, If he is not himself, he cannot be trusted. Watch him carefully and see that he does no mischief to himself or others. Ask one of the inspectors to stand at his right hand and stop him if he does not handle his pistol properly. Violet promised, and she passed on, setting the clock upon the stump and immediately drawing back to a suitable distance at the right where she stood wrapped in her long dark cloak. Her face shone ghastly white, even in its environment of snow-covered boughs, and noting this, Violet wished the minutes fewer between the present moment and the hour of five at which time he was to draw the trigger. "'Dr. Zabriskie,' quoth the inspector, "'we have endeavoured to make this trial a perfectly fair one. You are to have a shot at a small clock which has been placed within a suitable distance, and which you are expected to hit, guided only by the sound which it will make in striking the hour of five. Are you satisfied with the arrangement? Perfectly. Where is my wife? On the other side of the field, some ten paces from the stump upon which the clock is fixed. He bowed, and his face showed satisfaction. May I expect the clock to strike soon? In less than five minutes, was the answer. Then let me have the pistol. I wish to become acquainted with its size and weight. We glanced at each other, then across at her. She made a gesture. It was one of acquiescence. Immediately, the inspector placed the weapon in the blind man's hand. It was at once apparent that he understood the instrument, and Violet's hopes, which had been strong up to this moment, sank at his air of confidence. Thank God I am blind this hour and cannot see her, fell from his lips. Then, before the echo of these words had died away, he raised his voice and observed calmly enough, considering that he was about to prove himself a criminal in order to save himself from being thought a madman. Let no one move. I must have my ears free for catching the first stroke of the clock. And he raised the pistol before him. There was a moment of torturing suspense and deep, unbroken silence. Violet's eyes were on him, so she did not watch the clock. But she was suddenly moved by some irresistible impulse to note how Mrs. Zabriskie was bearing herself at this critical moment, and casting a hurried glance in her direction, she perceived her tall figure swaying from side to side as if under an intolerable strain of feeling. Her eyes were on the clock, the hands of which seemed to creep with snail-like pace along the dial, when unexpectedly, and a full minute before the minute hand had reached the stroke of five, Violet caught a movement on her part, saw the flash of something round and white show for an instant against the darkness of her cloak, and was about to shriek warning to the doctor, when the shrill, quick stroke of a clock rang out on the frosty air, followed by the ping and flash of a pistol. A sound of shattered glass, followed by a suppressed cry, told the bystanders that the bullet had struck the mark. But before anyone could move, or they could rid their eyes of the smoke which the wind had blown into their faces, there came another sound which made their hair stand on end, and sent the blood back in terror to their hearts. Another clock was striking, which they now perceived was still standing upright on the stump where Mrs. Zabriskie had placed it. Whence came the clock, then, which had struck before the time and been shattered for its pains? One quick look told them. 
on the ground ten paces to the right lay zulma zabriskie a broken clock at her side and in her breast a bullet which was fast sapping the life from her sweet eyes they had to tell him there was such pleading in her looks and never will any of the hearers forget the scream which rang from his lips as he realized the truth breaking from their midst he rushed forward and fell at her feet as if guided by some supernatural instinct zulma he shrieked what is this were not my hands dyed deep enough in blood that you should make me answerable for your life also her eyes were closed but she opened them looking long and steadily at his agonized face she faltered forth it is not you who have killed me it is your crime had you been innocent of mr hasbrook's death your bullet would never have found my heart did you think i could survive the proof that you had killed that good man i did it unwittingly i hush she commanded with an awful look which happily he could not see i had another motive i wished to prove to you even at the cost of my life that i loved you had always loved you and not it was now his turn to silence her his hand crept to her lips and his despairing face turned itself blindly towards those about them go he cried leave us let me take a last farewell of my dying wife without listeners or spectators consulting the eye of her employer who stood close beside her and seeing no hope in it violet fell slowly back the others followed and the doctor was left alone with his wife from the distant position they took they saw her arms creep round his neck saw her head fall confidingly on his breast then silence settled upon them and upon all nature the gathering twilight deepening till the last glow disappeared from the heavens above and from the circle of leafless trees which enclosed this tragedy from the outside world but at last there came a stir and dr zabriskie rising up before them with the dead body of his wife held closely to his breast confronted them with a countenance so rapturous that he looked like a man transfigured i will carry her to the boat said he not another hand shall touch her she was my true wife my true wife and he towered into an attitude of such dignity and passion that for a moment he took on heroic proportions and they forgot that he had just proved himself to have committed a cold-blooded and ghastly crime the stars were shining when the party again took their seats in the boat and if the scene of their crossing to jersey was impressive what shall be said of the return the doctor as before sat in the stern an awesome figure upon which the moon shone with a white radiance that seemed to lift his face out of the surrounding darkness and set it like an image of frozen horror before their eyes against his breast he held the form of his dead wife and now and then violet saw him stoop as if he were listening for some token of life from her set lips then he would lift himself again with hopelessness stamped upon his features only to lean forward in renewed hope that was again destined to be disappointment violet had been so overcome by this tragic end to all her hopes that her employer had been allowed to enter the boat with her seated at her side in the seat directly in front of the doctor he watched with her these simple tokens of a breaking heart saying nothing till they reached midstream when true to his instincts for all his awe and compassion he suddenly bent towards him and said dr zabriskie the mystery of your crime is no longer a mystery to me listen and see if i do not understand your temptation and how you a conscientious and god-fearing man came to slay your innocent neighbor a friend of yours or so he called himself had for a long time filled your ears with tales tending to make you suspicious of your wife and jealous of a certain man whom i will not name you knew that your friend had a grudge against this man and so for many months turned a deaf ear to his insinuations but finally some change which you detected in your wife's bearing or conversation roused your own suspicions and you began to doubt her truth and to curse your blindness which in a measure rendered you helpless the jealous fever grew and had risen to a high point when one night a memorable night this friend met you just as you were leaving town and with cruel craft whispered in your ear that the man you hated was even then with your wife and that if you would return at once to your home you would find him in her company the demon that lurks at the heart of all men good or bad thereupon took complete possession of you and you answered this false friend by saying that you would not return without a pistol whereupon he offered to take you to his house and give you his you consented and getting rid of your servant by sending him to poughkeepsie with your excuses you entered your friend's automobile you say you bought the pistol and perhaps you did but however that may be you left his house with it in your pocket and declining companionship 
walked home, arriving at the colonnade a little before midnight. Ordinarily you have no difficulty in recognizing your own doorstep, but, being in a heated frame of mind, you walked faster than usual, and so passed your own house and stopped at that of Mr. Hasbrook, one door beyond. As the entrances of these houses are all alike, there was but one way by which you could have made yourself sure that you had reached your own dwelling, and that was by feeling for the doctor's sign at the side of the door. But you never thought of that. Absorbed in dreams of vengeance, your sole impulse was to enter by the quickest means possible. Taking out your night key, you thrust it into the lock. It fitted, but it took strength to turn it, so much strength that the key was twisted and bent by the effort. But this incident, which would have attracted your attention at another time, was lost upon you at this moment. An entrance had been effected, and you were in too excited a frame of mind to notice at what cost, or to detect the small differences apparent in the atmosphere and furnishings of the two houses, trifles which would have arrested your attention under other circumstances, and made you pause before the upper floor had been reached. It was while going up the stairs that you took out your pistol, so that by the time you arrived at the front room door you held it already drawn and cocked in your hand. For, being blind, you feared escape on the part of your victim, and so waited for nothing but the sound of a man's voice before firing. When, therefore, the unfortunate Mr. Hasbrook, roused by this sudden intrusion, advanced with an exclamation of astonishment, you pulled the trigger and killed him on the spot. It must have been immediately upon his fall that you recognized from some word he uttered, or from some contact you may have had with your surroundings, that you were in the wrong house and had killed the wrong man. For you cried out in evident remorse, God, what have I done? And fled without approaching your victim. Descending the stairs, you rushed from the house, closing the front door behind you, and regaining your own without being seen. But here you found yourself baffled in your attempted escape by two things first, by the pistol you still held in your hand, and secondly, by the fact that the key upon which you depended for entering your own door was so twisted out of shape that you knew it would be useless for you to attempt to use it. What did you do in this emergency? You have already told us. Though the story seemed so improbable at the time, you found nobody to believe it but myself. The pistol you flung far away from you down the pavement, from which, by one of those rare chances which sometimes happens in this world, it was presently picked up by some late passer-by of more or less doubtful character. The door offered less of an obstacle than you had anticipated, for when you turned again you found it, if I am not greatly mistaken, ajar, left so, as we have reason to believe, by one who had gone out of it but a few minutes before in a state which left him but little master of his actions. It was this fact which provided you with an answer when you were asked how you succeeded in getting into Mr. Hasbrook's house after the family had retired for the night. Astonished at the coincidence, but hailing with gladness the deliverance which it offered, you went in and ascended at once into your wife's presence, and it was from her lips, and not from those of Mrs. Hasbrook, that the cry arose which startled the neighborhood and prepared men's minds for the tragic words which were shouted a moment later from the next house. But she who uttered the scream knew of no tragedy save that which was taking place in her own breast. She had just repulsed a dastardly suitor, and seeing you enter so unexpectedly in a state of unaccountable horror and agitation, was naturally stricken with dismay, and thought she saw your ghost, or what was worse, a possible avenger. While you, having failed to kill the man you sought, and having killed a man you esteemed, let no surprise on her part lure you into any dangerous self-betrayal. You strove instead to soothe her, and even attempted to explain the excitement under which you labored, by an account of your narrow escape at the station, till the sudden alarm from next door distracted her attention, and sent both your thoughts and hers in a different direction. Not till the conscience had fully awakened, and the horror of your act had had time to tell upon your sensitive nature, did you breathe forth those vague confessions which, not being supported by the only explanations which would have made them credible, led her as well as the police, to consider you affected in your mind. Your pride as a man and your consideration for her as a woman kept you silent, but did not keep the worm from preying upon your heart. Am I not correct in my surmises, Dr. Zabriskie? And is not this the true explanation of your crime? With a strange look he lifted up his face. Hush, said he, you will awaken her. See how peacefully she sleeps? I should not like to have her wakened now. She is so tired, and I—I I have not watched over her as I should. Appalled at his gesture, his look, his tone, Violet drew back, 
and for a few minutes no sound was to be heard but the steady dip dip of the oars and the lap lap of the waters against the boat then there came a quick uprising the swaying before her of something dark and tall and threatening and before she could speak or move or even stretch forth her hands to stay him the seat before her was empty and darkness had filled the place where but an instant previous he had sat a fearsome figure erect and rigid as a sphinx what little moonlight there was only served to show a few rising bubbles marking the spot where the unfortunate man had sunk with his much-loved burden as the widening circles fled farther and farther out the tide drifted the boat away and the spot was lost which had seen the termination of one of earth's saddest tragedies end of problem eight section thirteen of the golden slipper and other problems for violet strange this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the golden slipper and other problems for violet strange by anna katherine green section thirteen problem eight part one missing page thirteen one more just one more well-paying affair and i promise to stop really and truly to stop but purse why one more you have earned the amount you set for yourself or very nearly and though my help is not great in three months i can add enough no you cannot arthur you are doing well i appreciate it in fact i am just delighted to have you work for me in the way you do but you cannot in your present position make enough in three months or in six to meet the situation as i see it enough does not satisfy me the measure must be full heaped up and running over possible failure following promise must be provided for never must i feel myself called upon to do this kind of thing again besides i have never got over the zabriskie tragedy it haunts me continually something new may help to put it out of my head i feel guilty i was responsible no puss i will not have it that you were responsible some such end was bound to follow a complication like that sooner or later he would have been driven to shoot himself but not her no not her but do you think she would have given those few minutes of perfect understanding with her blind husband for a few years more of miserable life violet made no answer she was too absorbed in her surprise was this arthur had a few weeks work and a close connection with the real serious things of life made this change in him her face beamed at the thought which seeing but not understanding what underlay this evidence of joy he bent and kissed her saying with some of his old nonchalance forget it violet only don't let any one or anything lead you to interest yourself in another affair of the kind if you do i shall have to consult a certain friend of yours as to the best way of stopping this folly i mention no names oh you need not look so frightened only behave that's all he's right she acknowledged to herself as he sauntered away altogether right yet because she wanted the extra money the scene invited alarm that is for so young a girl as violet surveying it from an automobile some time after the stroke of midnight an unknown house at the end of a heavily shaded walk in the open doorway of which could be seen the silhouette of a woman's form leaning eagerly forward with arm outstretched in an appeal for help it vanished while she looked but the effect remained holding her to her seat for one startled moment this seemed strange for she had anticipated adventure one is not summoned from a private ball to ride a dozen miles into the country on an errand of investigation without some expectation of encountering the mysterious and the tragic but violet strange for all her many experiences was of a most susceptible nature and for the instant in which that door stood open with only the memory of that expectant figure to disturb the faintly lit vista of the hall beyond 
she felt that grip upon the throat which comes from an indefinable fear which no words can explain and no plummet sound but this soon passed with the setting of her foot to ground conditions changed and her emotions took on a more normal character the figure of a man now stood in the place held by the vanished woman and it was not only that of one she knew but that of one whom she trusted a friend whose very presence gave her courage with this recognition came a better understanding of the situation and it was with a beaming eye and unclouded features that she tripped up the walk to meet the expectant figure and outstretched hand of roger upjohn you here she exclaimed amid smiles and blushes as he drew her into the hall he at once launched forth into explanations mingled with apologies for the presumption he had shown in putting her to this inconvenience there was trouble in the house great trouble something had occurred for which an explanation must be found before morning or the happiness and honour of more than one person now under this unhappy roof would be wrecked he knew it was late that she had been obliged to take a long and dreary ride alone but her success with the problem which had once come near wrecking his own life had emboldened him to telephone to the office and but you are in a ball dress he cried in amazement did you think i came from a ball word reached me between the dances i did not go home i had been bidden to hurry he looked his appreciation but when he spoke it was to say this is the situation miss digby the lady who is to be married to-morrow who hopes to be married to-morrow how hopes who will be to marry to-morrow if a certain article lost in this house to-night can be found before any of the persons who have been dining here leave for their homes violet uttered an exclamation then mr cornell she began mr cornell has our utmost confidence roger hastened to interpose but the article missing is one which he might reasonably desire to possess and which he alone of all present had the opportunity of securing you can therefore see why he with his pride the pride of a man not rich engaged to marry a woman who is should declare that unless his innocence is established before daybreak the doors of st bartholomew will remain shut to-morrow but the article lost what is it miss digby will give you the particulars she is waiting to receive you he added with a gesture towards a half-open door at their right violet glanced that way then cast her looks up and down the hall in which they stood do you know that you have not told me in whose house i am not hers i know she lives in the city and you are twelve miles from harlem miss strange you are in the van brooklyn mansion famous enough you will acknowledge have you never been here before i have been by here but i recognize nothing in the dark what an exciting place for an investigation and mr van brooklyn have you never met him once when a child he frightened me then and he may frighten you now though i doubt it time has mellowed him besides i have prepared him for what might otherwise occasion him some astonishment naturally he would not look for just the sort of lady investigator i am about to introduce to him she smiled violet strange was a very charming young woman as well as a keen prober of odd mysteries the meeting between herself and miss digby was a sympathetic one after the first inevitable shock which the latter felt at sight of the beauty and fashionable appearance of the mysterious little being who was to solve her difficulties her glance which under other circumstances might have lingered unduly upon the piquant features and exquisite dressing of the fairy-like figure before her passed at once to violet's eyes in whose steady depths beamed an intelligence quite at odds with the coquettish dimples which so often misled the casual observer in his estimation of a character singularly subtle and well poised as for the impression she herself made upon violet it was the same she made upon every one no one could look long at florence digby and not recognize the loftiness of her spirit and the generous nature of her impulses in person she was tall 
and as she leaned to take Violet's hand, the difference between them brought out the salient points in each, to the great admiration of the one onlooker. Meantime, for all her interest in the case in hand, Violet could not help casting a hurried look about her, in gratification of the curiosity incited by her entrance into a house signalised from its foundation by such a series of tragic events. The result was disappointing. The walls were plain, the furniture simple, nothing suggestive in either, unless it was the fact that nothing was new, nothing modern. As it looked in the days of Burr and Hamilton, so it looked to-day even to the rather startling detail of candles which did duty on every side in place of gas as violet recalled the reason for this the fascination of the past seized upon her imagination there was no knowing where this might have carried her had not the feverish gleam in miss digby's eyes warned her that the present held its own excitement instantly she was all attention and listening with undivided mind to that lady's disclosures they were brief and to the following effect the dinner which had brought some half dozen people together in this house had been given in celebration of her impending marriage but it was also in a way meant as a compliment to one of the other guests a mr spielhagen who during the week had succeeded in demonstrating to a few experts the value of a discovery he had made which would transform a great industry in speaking of this discovery miss digby did not go into particulars the whole matter being far beyond her understanding but in stating its value she openly acknowledged that it was in the line of mr cornell's own work and one which involved calculations and a formula which if prematurely disclosed would invalidate the contract mr spielhagen hoped to make and thus destroy his present hopes of this formula but two copies existed one was locked up in a safe deposit vault in boston the other he had brought into the house on his person and it was the latter which was now missing having been abstracted during the evening from a manuscript of sixteen or more sheets under circumstances which she would now endeavour to relate mr van brooklyn their host had in his melancholy life but one interest which could be at all absorbing this was for explosives as consequence much of the talk at the dinner-table had been on mr spielhagen's discovery and possible changes it might introduce into this especial industry as these worked out from a formula kept secret from the trade could not but affect greatly mr cornell's interests she found herself listening intently when mr van brooklyn with an apology for his interference ventured to remark that if mr spielhagen had made a valuable discovery in this line so had he and one which he had substantiated by many experiments it was not a marketable one such as mr spielhagen's was but in his work upon the same and in the tests which he had been led to make he had discovered certain instances he would gladly name which demanded exceptional procedure to be successful if mr spielhagen's method did not allow for these exceptions nor make suitable provision for them then mr spielhagen's method will fail more times than it would succeed did it so allow and so provide it would relieve him greatly to learn that it did the answer came quickly yes it did but later and after some further conversation mr spielhagen's confidence seemed to wane and before they left the dinner-table he openly declared his intention of looking over his manuscript again that very night in order to be sure and the formula therein contained duly covered all the exceptions mentioned by mr van brooklyn if mr cornell's countenance showed any change at this moment she for one had not noticed it but the bitterness with which he remarked upon the other's good fortune in having discovered this formula of whose entire success he had no doubt was apparent to everybody and naturally gave point to the circumstances which a short time afterward associated him with the disappearance of the same the ladies there were two others besides herself having withdrawn in a body to the music-room the gentlemen all proceeded to the library to smoke here conversation loosed from the one topic which had hitherto engrossed it 
was proceeding briskly when mr spielhagen with nervous gesture impulsively looked about him and said i cannot rest till i have run through my thesis again where can i find a quiet spot i won't be long i read very rapidly it was for mr van brooklyn to answer but no word coming from him every eye turned his way only to find him sunk in one of those fits of abstraction so well known to his friends and from which no one who has seen this strange man's peace of mind at heart ever presumes to rouse him what was to be done these moods of their singular host sometimes lasted half an hour and mr spielhagen had not the appearance of a man of patience indeed he presently gave proof of the great uneasiness he was labouring under for noticing a door standing ajar at the other side of the room he remarked to those around him a den and lighted do you see any objection to my shutting myself in there for a few minutes no one venturing to reply he rose and giving a slight push to the door disclosed a small room exquisitely panelled and brightly lighted but without one article of furniture in it not even a chair the very place quoth mr spielhagen and lifting a light cane-bottomed chair from the many standing about he carried it inside and shut the door behind him several minutes passed during which the man who had served at table entered with a tray on which were several small glasses evidently containing some choice liqueur finding his master fixed in one of his strange moods he set the tray down and pointing to one of the glasses said that is for mr van brooklyn it contains his usual quieting powder and urging the gentlemen to help themselves he quietly left the room mr upjohn lifted the glass nearest him and mr cornell seemed about to do the same when he suddenly reached forward and catching up one farther off started for the room in which mr spielhagen had so deliberately secluded himself why he did all this why above all things he should reach across the tray for a glass instead of taking the one under his hand he can no more explain than why he has followed many another unhappy impulse nor did he understand the nervous start given by mr spielhagen at his entrance or the stare with which that gentleman took the glass from his hand and mechanically drank its contents till he saw how his hand had stretched itself across the sheet of paper he was reading in an open attempt to hide the lines visible between his fingers then indeed the intruder flushed and withdrew in great embarrassment fully conscious of his indiscretion but not deeply disturbed till mr van brooklyn suddenly arousing and glancing down at the tray placed very near his hand remarked in some surprise dobbs seems to have forgotten me then indeed the unfortunate mr cornell realized what he had done it was the glass intended for his host which he had caught up and carried into the other room the glass which he had been told contained a drug of what folly he had been guilty and how tame would be any effort at excuse attempting none he rose and with a hurried glance at mr upjohn who flushed in sympathy at his distress he crossed to the door he had lately closed upon mr spielhagen but feeling his shoulder touched as his hand pressed the knob he turned to meet the eye of mr van brooklyn fixed upon him with an expression which utterly confounded him where are you going that gentleman asked the questioning tone the severe look expressive at once of displeasure and astonishment were most disconcerting but mr cornell managed to stammer forth mr spielhagen is in here consulting his thesis when your man brought in the cordial i was awkward enough to catch up your glass and carry it in to mr spielhagen he drank it and i i'm anxious to see if it did him any harm as he uttered the last word he felt mr van brooklyn's hand slip from his shoulder but no word accompanied the action nor did his host make the least move to follow him into the room this was a matter of great regret to him later as it left him for a moment out of the range of every eye during which he says he simply stood in a state of shock at seeing mr spielhagen still sitting there manuscript in hand but with his head fallen forward and eyes closed dead asleep or he hardly knew what the sight so paralyzed him 
whether or not this was the exact truth and the whole truth mr cornell certainly looked very unlike himself as he stepped back into mr van brooklyn's presence and he was only partially reassured when that gentleman protested that there was no real harm in the drug and that mr spielhagen would be all right if left awake naturally and without shock however as his present attitude was one of great discomfort they decided to carry him back and lay him on the library lounge but before doing this mr upjohn drew from his flaxseed grasp the precious manuscript and carrying it into the larger room placed it on a remote table where it remained undisturbed till mr spielhagen suddenly coming to himself at the end of some fifteen minutes missed the sheets from his hand and bounding up crossed the room to repossess himself of them his face as he lifted them up and rapidly ran through them with ever accumulating anxiety told them what they had to expect the page containing the formula was gone violet now saw her problem part two there was no doubt about the loss i have mentioned all could see that page thirteen was not there in a vain second handling of every sheet the one so numbered was not to be found page fourteen met the eye on the top of the pile and page twelve finished it off at the bottom but no page thirteen in between or anywhere else where had it vanished and through whose agency had this misadventure occurred no one could say or at least no one there made any attempt to do so though everybody started to look for it but where look the adjoining small room offered no facilities for hiding a cigar end much less a square of shining white paper bare walls a bare floor and a single chair for furniture comprised all that was to be seen in this direction nor could the room in which they then stood be thought to hold it unless it was on the person of some one of them could this be the explanation of the mystery no man looked his doubts but mr cornell possibly divining the general feeling stepped up to mr van brooklyn and in a cool voice but with the red burning hotly on either cheek said so as to be heard by every one present i demand to be searched at once and thoroughly a moment's silence then the common cry we will all be searched is mr spielhagen sure that the missing page was with the others when he sat down in the adjoining room to read his thesis asked their perturbed host very sure came the emphatic reply indeed i was just going through the formula itself when i fell asleep you are ready to assert this i am ready to swear it mr cornell repeated his request i demand that you make a thorough search of my person i must be cleared and instantly of every suspicion he gravely asserted or how can i marry miss digby to-morrow after that there was no further hesitation one and all subjected themselves to the ordeal suggested even mr spielhagen but this effort was as futile as the rest the lost page was not found what were they to think what were they to do there seemed to be nothing left to do and yet some further attempt must be made towards the recovery of this important formula mr cornell's marriage and mr spielhagen's business success both depended upon its being in the latter's hands before six in the morning when he was engaged to hand it over to a certain manufacturer sailing for europe on an early steamer five hours had mr van brooklyn a suggestion to offer no he was as much at sea as the rest simultaneously look crossed look blankness was on every face let us call the ladies suggested one it was done and however great the tension had been before it was even greater when miss digby stepped upon the scene but she was not a woman to be shaken from her poise even by a crisis of this importance when the dilemma had been presented to her and the full situation grasped she looked first at mr cornell and then at mr spielhagen and quietly said there is but one explanation possible of this matter mr spielhagen will excuse me but he is evidently mistaken in thinking that he saw the lost page among the rest 
the condition into which he was thrown by the unaccustomed drug he had drank made him liable to hallucinations i have not the least doubt he thought he had been studying the formula at the time he dropped off to sleep i have every confidence in the gentleman's candour but so have i in that of mr cornell she supplemented with a smile an exclamation from mr van brooklyn and a subdued murmur from all but mr spielhagen testified to the effect of this suggestion and there is no saying what might have been the result if mr cornell had not hurriedly put in this extraordinary and most unexpected protest miss digby has my gratitude said he for a confidence which i hope to prove to be deserved but i must say this for mr spielhagen he was correct in saying that he was engaged in looking over his formula when i stepped into his presence with the glass of cordial if you were not in a position to see the hurried way in which his hand instinctively spread itself over the page he was reading i was and if that does not seem conclusive to you then i feel bound to state that in unconsciously following this movement of his i plainly saw the number written on the top of the page and that number was thirteen a loud exclamation this time from spielhagen himself announced his gratitude and corresponding change of attitude toward the speaker wherever that damned page has gone he protested advancing towards cornell with outstretched hand you have nothing to do with its disappearance instantly all constraint fled and every utterance took on a relieved expression but the problem remained suddenly those very words passed some one's lips and with their utterance mr upjohn remembered how at an extraordinary crisis in his own life he had been helped and an equally difficult problem settled by a little lady secretly attached to a private detective agency if she could only be found and hurried here before morning all might yet be well he would make the effort such wild schemes sometimes work he telephoned to the office and was there anything else miss strange would like to know part three miss strange thus appealed to asked where the gentlemen were now she was told that they were still all together in the library the ladies had been sent home then let us go to them said violet hiding under a smile her great fear that here was an affair that might very easily spell for her that dismal word failure so great was that fear that under all ordinary circumstances she would have had no thought for anything else in the short interim between this stating of the problem and her speedy entrance among the persons involved but the circumstances of this case were so far from ordinary or rather let me put it this way the setting of the case was so very extraordinary that she scarcely thought of the problem before her in her great interest in the house through whose rambling halls she was being so carefully guided so much that was tragic and heart-rending had occurred here the van brooklyn name the van brooklyn history above all the van brooklyn tradition which made the house unique in the country's annals of which more hereafter all made an appeal to her imagination and centred her thoughts on what she saw about her there was door which no man ever opened had never opened since revolutionary times should she see it should she know it if she did see it then mr van brooklyn himself just to meet him under any conditions and in any place was an event but to meet him here under the pall of his own mystery no wonder she had no words for her companions or that her thoughts clung to this anticipation in wonder and almost fearsome delight his story was a well-known one a bachelor and a misanthrope he lived absolutely alone save for a large entourage of servants all men and elderly ones at that he never visited though he now and then as on this occasion entertained certain persons under his roof he declined every invitation for himself avoiding even with equal strictness all evening amusements of whatever kind which would detain him in the city after ten at night perhaps this was to ensure no break in his rule of life never to sleep out of his own bed though he was a man well over fifty he had not spent according to his own statement 
but two nights out of his own bed since his return from Europe in early boyhood, and those were in obedience to a judicial summons which took him to Boston. This was his main eccentricity, but he had another, which is apparent enough from what has already been said. He avoided women. If thrown in with them during his short visits into town, he was invariably polite and at times companionable, but he never sought them out. Nor had gossip, contrary to its usual habit, ever linked his name with one of the sex. Yet he was a man of more than ordinary attraction. His features were fine and his figure impressive. He might have been the cynosure of all eyes had he chosen to enter crowded drawing-rooms or even to frequent public assemblages, but having turned his back on everything of the kind in his youth, he had found it impossible to alter his habits with advancing years, nor was he now expected to. The position he had taken was respected. Leonard Van Brooklyn was no longer criticised was there any explanation for this strangely self-centred life those who knew him best seemed to think so in the first place he had sprung from an unfortunate stock events of unusual and tragic nature had marked the family of both parents nor had his parents themselves been exempt from this seeming fatality antagonistic in tastes and temperament they had dragged on an unhappy existence in the old home till both natures rebelled and a separation ensued which not only disunited their lives but sent them to opposite sides of the globe never to return again at least that was the inference drawn from the peculiar circumstances attending the event on the morning of one never to be forgotten day john van brooklyn the grandfather of the present representative of the family found the following note from his son lying on the library table father life in this house or any house with her is no longer endurable one of us must go the mother should not be separated from her child therefore it is i whom you will never see again forget me but be considerate of her and the boy william six hours later another note was found this time from the wife father tied to a rotting corpse what does one do lop off one's arm if necessary to rid one of the contact as all love between your son and myself is dead i can no longer live within the sound of his voice as this is his home he is the one to remain in it may our child reap the benefit of his mother's loss and his father's affection rhoda both were gone and gone for ever simultaneous in their departure they preserved each his own silence and sent no word back if the one went east and the other west they may have met on the other side of the globe but never again in the home which sheltered their boy for him and for his grandfather they had sunk from sight in the great sea of humanity leaving them stranded on an isolated and mournful shore the grandfather steeled himself to the double loss for the child's sake but the boy of eleven succumbed few of the world's great sufferers of whatever age or condition have mourned as this child mourned or shown the effects of his grief so deeply or so long not till he had passed his majority did the line carved in one day in his baby forehead lose any of its intensity and there are those who declare that even later than that the midnight stillness of the house was disturbed from time to time by his muffled shriek of mother mother sending the servants from the house and adding one more horror to the many which clung about this accursed mansion of this cry violet had heard and it was that and the door but i have already told you about the door which she was still looking for when her two companions suddenly halted and she found herself on the threshold of the library in full view of mr van brooklyn and his two guests slight and fairy-like in figure with an air of modest reserve more in keeping with her youth and dainty dimpling beauty than with her errand her appearance produced an astonishment none of which the gentlemen were able to disguise this the clever detective with a genius for social problems and odd elusive cases 
this darling of the ballroom in satin and pearls mr spielhagen glanced at mr cornell and mr cornell at mr spielhagen and both at mr upjohn in very evident distrust as for violet she had eyes only for mr van brooklyn who stood before her in a surprise equal to that of the others but with more restraint in its expression she was not disappointed in him she had expected to see a man reserved almost to the point of austerity and she found his first look even more awe-compelling than her imagination had pictured so much so indeed that her resolution faltered and she took a quick step backward which seeing he smiled and her heart and hopes grew warm again that he could smile and smile with absolute sweetness was her great comfort when later but i am introducing you too hurriedly to the catastrophe there is much more to be told first i pass over the preliminaries and come at once to the moment when violet having listened to the repetition of the full facts stood with downcast eyes before these gentlemen complaining in some alarm to herself they expect me to tell them now and without further search or parley just where the missing page is i shall have to balk that expectation without losing their confidence but how summoning up her courage and meeting each inquiring eye with a look which seemed to carry a different message to each she remarked very quietly this is not a matter to guess at i must have time and i must look a little deeper into the facts just given me i presume that the table i see over there is the one upon which mr upjohn laid the manuscript during mr spielhagen's unconsciousness all nodded is it i mean the table in the same condition it was then has nothing been taken from it except the manuscript nothing then the missing page is not there she smiled pointing to its bare top a pause during which she stood with her gaze fixed on the floor before her she was thinking and thinking hard suddenly she came to a decision addressing mr upjohn she asked if he were quite sure that in taking the manuscript from mr spielhagen's hand he had neither disarranged nor dropped one of its pages the answer was unequivocal then she declared with quiet assurance and a steady meeting with her own of every eye as the thirteenth page was not found among the others when they were taken from this table nor on the persons of either mr cornell or mr spielhagen it is still in that inner room impossible came from every lip each in a different tone that room is absolutely empty may i have a look at its emptiness she asked with a naive glance at mr van brooklyn there is positively nothing in the room but the chair mr spielhagen sat on objected that gentleman with a noticeable air of reluctance still may i not have a look at it she persisted with that disarming smile she kept for great occasions mr van brooklyn bowed he could not refuse a request so urged but his step was slow and his manner next to ungracious as he led the way to the door of the adjoining room and threw it open just what she had been told to expect bare walls and floors and an empty chair yet she did not instantly withdraw but stood silently contemplating the panelled wainscoting surrounding her as though she suspected it of containing some secret hiding-place not apparent to the eye mr van brooklyn noting this hastened to say the walls are sound miss strange they contain no hidden cupboards and that door she asked pointing to a portion of the wainscoting so exactly like the rest that only the most experienced eye could detect the line of deeper colouring which marked an opening for an instant mr van brooklyn stood rigid then the immovable pallor which was one of his chief characteristics gave way to a deep flush as he explained there was a door there once but it has been permanently closed with cement he forced himself to add his countenance losing its evanescent colour till it shone ghastly again in the strong light with difficulty violet preserved her show of composure the door she murmured to herself i have found it 
the great historic door but her tone was light as she ventured to say then it can no longer be opened by your hand or any other it could not be opened with an axe violet sighed in the midst of her triumph her curiosity had been satisfied but the problem she had been set to solve looked inexplicable but she was not one to yield easily to discouragement marking the disappointment approaching to disdain in every eye but mr upjohn's she drew herself up she had not far to draw and made this final proposal a sheet of paper she remarked of the size of this one cannot be spirited away or dissolved into thin air it exists it is here and all we want is some happy thought in order to find it i acknowledge that that happy thought has not come to me yet but sometimes i get it in what may seem to you a very odd way forgetting myself i try to assume the individuality of the person who has worked the mystery if i can think with his thoughts i possibly may follow him in his actions in this case i should like to make believe for a few moments that i am mr spielhagen with what a delicious smile she said this i should like to hold his thesis in my hand and be interrupted in my reading by mr cornell offering his glass of cordial then i should like to nod and slip off mentally into a deep sleep possibly in that sleep the dream may come which will clarify the whole situation will you humour me so far a ridiculous concession but finally she had her way the farce was enacted and they left her as she had requested them to do alone with her dreams in the small room suddenly they heard her cry out and in another moment she appeared before them the picture of excitement is this chair standing exactly as it did when mr spielhagen occupied it she asked no said mr upjohn it faced the other way she stepped back and twirled the chair about with her disengaged hand so mr upjohn and mr spielhagen both nodded so did the others when she glanced at them with a sign of ill-concealed satisfaction she drew their attention to herself then eagerly cried gentlemen look here seating herself she allowed her whole body to relax till she presented the picture of one calmly asleep then as they continued to gaze at her with fascinated eyes not knowing what to expect they saw something white escape from her lap and slide across the floor till it touched and was stayed by the wainscot it was the top page of the manuscript she held and as some inkling of the truth reached their astonished minds she sprang impetuously to her feet and pointing to the fallen sheet cried do you understand now look where it lies and then look here she had bounded towards the wall and was now on her knees pointing to the bottom of the wainscot just a few inches to the left of the fallen page a crack she cried under what was once the door it is a very thin one hardly perceptible to the eye but see here she laid her finger on the fallen paper and drawing it towards her pushed it carefully against the lower edge of the wainscot half of it at once disappeared i could easily slip it all through she assured them withdrawing the sheet and leaping to her feet in triumph you know now where the missing page lies mr spielhagen all that remains is for mr van brooklyn to get it for you end of missing page 13 part 3